Given that that wasn't in the cards, our duty now is to celebrate her extraordinary life um, in, in the wonderful way that we will this afternoon. So I'm so delighted that you're all able to come. Um, my honor is my honor this afternoon to speak on behalf of staff, board, volunteers of the Clay and Glass Gallery, both those who are um, employed or volunteering today and those who uh, have been employed or volunteered over the last uh, almost 20 years. Um, it's, um, I speak for everyone on our staff when I say it's an honor to be associated with and to have a chance to serve the community through the Clay and Glass Gallery. Um, if you look to your right, um, and it's very, it's wonderful that Knox Presbyterian Church built this church right here with windows so that we could see the Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery, but what you see, of course, on your right is the bricks and mortar legacy of Winifred Chance and others, of course. But um, I think I can say, without fear of contradiction, that um, notwithstanding all of the elements that had come together 20 plus years ago for the establishment of the Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery, that if it hadn't been for Wynn, that building would not be here today. Um, and her fingerprints really are all over it. Um, the, um, as, I, as I look myself across at it, the, the light box in the front, I know several years ago was something that Wynne helped to pay for. When we go into the gallery afterwards for the reception, when we cross the threshold, as you know, we'll be in the Keith and Winifred Sean's gallery. And the, the banner signs that have been up since September 2010, um, which were our new logo designed by Alex Haig of Bright House Branding Group with his team, but when made it possible for us to, to create those signs and to have them up on the building, really kind of announcing that, that we were 
we were here still and that we were open for business and that we were engaging with the community. And uh, so in my relatively short experience working with Wynne, um, I found her, of course, to be the most generous person imaginable, and generous not only in terms of in financial terms, but her, her generosity of spirit really eclipsed the, even her generosity financially. Um, she was always so willing and, uh, um, to hear what was going on, loved to hear what was going on, and was always, in my experience, uh, more than ready to help. Um, and in those, when I say, uh, I said earlier that uh, the gallery wouldn't be there if it weren't for Wynn, um, and I've had the pleasure of talking with people who were colleagues of hers back then, and uh, so that's why I could say without fear of contradiction that people said that, because again, with all the pieces that were in place, but, but Wynne brought a vitality, a spirit, she even brought her secretarial skills, she brought an innate uh, business acumen and, uh, and strategic thinking that allowed this, this gallery to come into fruition. And as you know, nobody cared for the gallery as much as Wynne did. Um, she was passionate and consistent and, um, and, and, and rallied, rallied everyone around to that vision. And, um, and it was, in my mind, uh, uh, it, it, was a, it was a grand and audacious vision, was it not, uh, 20 years ago for the group that was assembled here to imagine that it could create um, a, 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 an art museum dedicated to um, clay and glass artistry right here in Waterloo. And in my mind, it, it really is um, a grand and audacious vision that is um, the likes of Tom Patterson's idea that there could be a, a Shakespearean festival in Stratford in the early 50s, or Brian Doherty's notion that there could be a festival de uh, dedicated to the works of George Bernard Shaw and his contemporaries in Niagara on the Lake. And it's in the same league, I, I'd say, as Jim Balsley's notion that there could be a center for governance innovation, international governance innovation, or Mike Lazaridis' um, vision of having a perimeter institute uh, in, uh, sorry, having an uh, institute for the study of theoretical physics here in Waterloo. And indeed, the congregation of Knox Presbyterian Church deciding and their tagline is committed to the core. We're going to build here in Uptown where, where we know we have a place. So this is an extraordinary and unique corner. And uh, as you may have seen in Christopher Hume's article in The Star a couple of weeks ago, um, he said that this was a unique in Canada cluster of architectural excellence. So, so we're in very good company, but so too is CG Primitive Institute and Knox in good company with us there. And again, it's really, it's a result of Wynne's extraordinarily hard work. When I now describe to people who aren't totally familiar with where we are, I now just say that the Perimeter Institute is in our backyard, and, uh, which is quite grand, I know. But uh, <laughs> So uh, the other thing that I can say without uh, fear of contradiction is that having launched the gallery, that it would not have made its way through the past 19 years without wind support. Um, for lots of reasons, um, and she was there consistently to help. Um, among, I would say lots of reasons. One of the reasons is that funding agencies such as the Canada Council and the Ontario Arts Council don't even begin to think of funding arts organizations till they've been around for three to five years. And then typically you start with project grants and then you move on to operating funding. And um, so it's to be sustainable during that period is not easy. And so really it was, it was Wynne who was there to ensure that her baby, as she thought of the gallery, um, could continue to be nurtured and get to the point which it is now and has been for a number of years of having uh, operating funding from, from those agencies. Um, the, the other thing I'd just like to mention, which you would have seen on the, in the slides here, is the uh, creation of the Winifred Shantz Award for Ceramics an extraordinarily important element of the life of the Clay and Glass Gallery. And, um, and it's also reflective of Wynne's real visionary sense of what needed to be done in the field, broadly defined. Um, so we had the gallery, but I think she understood that in order to give ceramic artists 
the opportunity to grow and to reach their potential, um, which in turn would result in more and better exhibitions in the, in the gallery space, that having a national award, a prestigious national award, was something that would really enhance all those aspects of the, of the infrastructure, let's say. And uh, there have been 11 award winners, and I know of only one who is here today. Where are you, Susan? Oh, and another one, Susan Collette. So, so we've got, so we have more than one. <laughs> um, welcome, and uh, um, I, um, I had, uh, I had asked Susan Collette, who won the award first in, it was the first winner in 2001, if she could just tell me a little bit about the impact that it had, had on her. And uh, so, if I may, I'll just read a little bit of what she, what she sent me. Um, I studied in uh, uh, Jingdezhen uh, at the residency. I was in China for three months and it truly changed my life. Wind's support encouraged me at a crucial early time in my career, fostering my self-confidence to, to keep trying and have faith in myself. It was not only through the generous prize, but her continued support through correspondence and purchase of my works at shows of mine that she made a great effort to see. And Susan notes that, uh, that Wynne and Aggie drove to Prince Edward County, to Picton, in 2005 to see an exhibition of Susan's and indeed purchased a piece. And needless to say, Susan was very moved by that. Uh, the experience in China was a humanistic one in that not only did I learn valuable techniques in ways of working, and for example, seeing large-scale assembled Chinese urns encouraged a growth in the scale of my own work years later, but also about working closely with people from another culture, infusing meaning and the importance of the everyday experience. I studied the local techniques of a 2,000 year history in the making of ceramics in Jingdezhen, the center for export porcelain to the world. It was unbelievable to witness ancient factory methods, individual workers, mass production, huge scale at the same time, attention to minute detail. It all infused and strengthened concepts in my own making and has fil uh, filtered through me and fed me all these years since. So what a wonderful statement by, uh, by Susan. And I know if, if we had similar statements from the other uh, 10 artists who had won, there'd be similar stories of transformational growth as a result of this unique opportunity that Wynne had provided them through, uh, through the Winifred Schatz Award for Ceramics. And um, I am pleased to tell you that um, thanks to the people who have responsibility for Wynne's estate, uh, we already know um, that uh, we will be able to hold the award again in 2012, uh, October the 11th, so mark that date in your calendar. And uh, we're thrilled, of course, that we can, uh, with the support, as I say, of those responsible for the estate, ensure that the Winifred Chance Award will continue in the future. So that award built strength and capacity among ceramic artists and also excited them about the gallery. The other, um, other uh, privilege I have is to say a few words about the MFA program at the University of Waterloo. And uh, this was a program that was considered early in the 1990s and many of those who, uh, who were responsible for it are with us today. Anne Roberts, Art Green, Tony Urquhart, Don Mackay, Jane Byers and Bruce Taylor, was the, that was the group that put together this idea for, for a unique MFA program. And um, I once again will just read from some information I received from the uh, Fine Art Department. The defining feature and jewel of the MFA program at UW is the Keith and Winshant Summer Institute, in, uh, sorry, internship. Each student accepted into the program is awarded a Shantz internship, which involves working uh, with a professional established artist anywhere in the world after their first year of study at UW. In this way, the student is immersed firsthand in the day-to-day -day life of an internationally successful artist ranging from installing exhibitions in major gallery venues and experiencing the attendant glamorous openings to mixing colors or cutting out stencils with an exacto knife for hours on end in the studio. The interaction between the artist and student is extraordinarily fruitful and cannot be replicated in any academic environment. 
Uh, to date, 60 students have been awarded Ashan's internship in such varied locations as London, Berlin, New York, Los Angeles, Buenos Aires, Korea, and China, and have worked with distinguished artists throughout the world. Um, over uh, 60, um, of those 60 students, at least 80% of them are vigorous, active professional artists, many with prominent reputations, a very high success rate indeed. And I, I will read, if I may, one quote from one of the students, just so you'll get a sense of, of what it meant to this student. Um, one of the most attractive incentives uh, to apply to the University of Waterloo's MFA program was the Chance internship. I made sure to take advantage of every aspect of this opportunity. The reputation of the program and the caliber of artists emerging from the school also factored into my decision to apply. The invaluable time I spent conversing with and being challenged by the artists I worked with has given me an entirely new sense of confidence in my creative and artistic voice. The internship also gave me the opportunity to spend uh, four months absorbing the unique culture of one of the most amazing cities in the world. This internship was truly life-changing. So therefore, um, a fir between first and second year fine arts student, a sentiment very much like that expressed by Susan, that Wynne had, uh, Keith and Wynne had given those students a unique opportunity for a transformational experience, in this case, in the, uh, uh, at the time of their, um, uh, between first and second years of the MFA. Um, and also, when I'm told, uh, would the students when they came back would make a presentation. Wynne was always there, always excited. And in fact, she had told me about how exciting it was to hear from the students about what they had experienced, what they had learned, and just how extraordinarily grateful they were. Um, and so, just as the Chancel Award will continue in 2012, I will read this last paragraph, which says, in the fall of this year, the University of Waterloo Art Gallery will mount an exhibition of the work of some of the graduates of the UW MFA Winshans internship. <clears throat> this exhibition was in the planning stages before Win passed on, and she was well aware of it. Now the exhibition has taken on a memorial dimension. Please join us at the, in the autumn at the University of Waterloo Art Gallery to celebrate once again the life of Win Shantz. Her vibrant energy and unequivocal support for the arts will live on in the legacy of the Shantz internship. So uh, needless to say, we will see that everyone uh, in our extended family knows about that, uh, that exhibition in the, uh, in the fall as well as the Shantz Award. So I, just to wrap up my section now, I, I, a couple of things that I would like to share with you of a very personal nature, uh, but that are reflective of Wynne's extraordinary personality, character, and generosity. And um, in just a couple of days before we broke for Christmas in December 2010, Wynne came up the elevator, and there she was. And, Hi, Wynne, and uh, she had a, I still have it, luckily, a, a card, an envelope with my name on it. So I opened it up, greetings um, to the staff at the Clay and Glass Seasons Greeting, wishing you all a very happy Christmas regards, Wynne Shantz. Really nice, but it also had a check for $25,000 in it. And I, I was truly struck dumb. I didn't, I didn't, I, I mean, as a kid, I think the most I ever got was 25 bucks in the cards <laughs> from my grandmother. But uh, so, and, and she just said, I hope this helps. Um, how extraordinary, and, uh, and of course it, it helped tremendously. Um, so this is, this is a keepsake that I will treasure always. Um, and then I also had the great pleasure of developing, a, a, I think, a nice relationship with her. And so we would periodically have lunch at, uh, at Casa Mia, um, which was, worked for her, worked for me. She could leave the car, where she could keep an eye on the dog, and. Uh, you know, it's, and so we'd have a sandwich and a salad or a bowl of soup or something like that, and we'd just take turns um, uh, treating the other person. And so, um, and I remember this date, September 22nd, it was a Thursday, glorious day, not unlike this, there'll be a fall, and we, so we had lunch, and, uh, and during the course of the lunch, just, she, she, at the end, she bought a, a jar of marmalade, and, um, and uh, so we started talking about marmalade. Now, I'm a marmalade addict. Right? And I know, I know of no one else. So Wynne was my marmalade buddy. And uh, so that 
same, the next weekend on the 24th, uh, two days later, my niece was being married in Kingston. And so while I was there, I came across a nice jar of marmalade from a Wolf Island producer. So I brought that back and left it in her mailbox. And then periodically I would, uh, and she'd phone and she'd say, well, I like that, and that was a lovely thing. I mean, always very grateful, but we would critique the marmalades. And uh, <laughs> so, um, so I would leave her marmalades, and I have, I won't worry with them, but I have some criteria around what makes good marmalade. But so um, um, certainly, um, I don't ever expect to find another marmalade buddy, but you never know. And uh, we also talked a lot about opera because uh, I love music and as uh, does she and great support of the KW Symphony. Um, so we had, uh, we had talked about going to Toronto to an opera one day, but that unfortunately didn't happen. And then one other lunch that we had, and this was a month or so later, it was Wynne's turn to my lunch. Um, so, and I was updating her on the gallery and told her that we had applied um, to, for funding for $10,000 to be able to, to, uh, um, to uh, access, um, subscribe to a database for fundraising, uh, both corporate and foundation uh, database. And um, so I told her about that and said, you know, we'd put in our best, put together the best application, but uh, it hadn't been, we applied for 10,000, it hadn't been successful, but we did get $500. And, uh, and she said, oh, that's ridiculous. And she fumbled around in her purse, got out her checkbook, and wrote a check for $10,000. And uh, so, once again, uh, so, that, that, um, so that gift has enabled us to acquire this, uh, this Metasoft database. And in a lovely, ironic way, um, that this, that gift is the gift that we'll keep on giving. Right? That we will explore that database, we will hopefully um, score some big wins from that. Oh, no pun intended, sorry. Um, and, uh, we, and so it's a lovely, a lovely uh, ongoing um, reminder of Wynne's generosity, personally, spiritually, and every other way. Um, so we'll miss her. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Aggie Bainan, and I'm Wynn's buddy for almost 25 years and uh, business partner at Harbinger Gallery. And I'm going to speak uh, on behalf of uh, myself, my family, friends, and artists across Canada. Um, but first of all, I want to thank a lot of her friends, many of her friends and family who sent me stories about when, which I have incorporated or tried to incorporate into what I'm going to tell you today. Wynne loves sunshine. That's what we got today. And me, I love a good blizzard. We respected each other's differences and had a richer friendship for them. Ann Roberts introduced me to Wynne Chance almost 25 years ago. These two great friends took it upon themselves to convince folks in our community that we needed to build a national art gallery in order to preserve clay and glass, the history of Canada's amazing clay and glass artists. With the help of many forward-thinking people, and many of you are here tonight, today, this afternoon, uh, they succeeded. Wynne and I were co-chairs for the clay and glass gallery's groundbreaking events, and we worked together almost daily for a year. My husband, Doug, and I got to know Wynne and Keith Shantz extremely well, as together we launched ideas for these festivities. From early on, my family, Doug and our three daughters, Kathleen, Shannon, and Stephanie, who are over here, adopted Wynne and she us. After Keith died, it was just natural that Wynne be included in our family, in our family planning. Shannon fondly recalls, our family would get together to celebrate Christmas, where we enjoyed giving gifts, her gifts of tea, marmalade, handmade gifts, and most important, separate bookings with each of us for dinners, movies, and other shared treats. Many an evening, we sat around our dining room table, playing games and laughing at nothing. Wynne took part in conversations ranging from which university the girls should attend, what careers should be pursued, 
and even spoke about the merits of the various young men our girls were dating, <laughs> leading up to their marriages. We always had an opinion, surprise. But she shared it in a manner that made the girls feel special while making them think. How I remember Wynne best is through her stories, not just hers and mine, but the stories of the many friends she made over her very long life. At her dinner table, Wynne shared some remarkable tales about her family and friends. Her grandfather, Sam Fitch, was a great influence on Wynne. He was a self-made man. Sam drove the first motorized cab in England, and each Saturday night he would pick up Winston Churchill, deliver the Prime Minister to his various parties, then pour him up his steps to his butler in the wee hours. Not too many years ago, Wynne and her dear friend Vivian holiday were holidaying in London. And Wynne, being Wynne, chatted up the cabbie, and he informed them that Sam Fitch was still a legend after all these years among London cab drivers. I have no doubt the same blood ran through Wynne's veins. Joyce Scroxton, Wynne's oldest friend and a workmate during the Second World War, relayed this story of how Wynne ended up in Canada. Working as very junior members of the civil service in the Home Office, Joyce and Wynne were evacuated to Bournemouth in the south, south coast uh, in 1941. Here, Don McLaren set up a superb YMCA that catered to all allied, clear, all allied air crew, no matter where they, their origin. Wynne and Joyce and some of their friends helped Don in the office and entertained air crew. Joyce recalls, from the beginning, Don and Wynne were an item. And later, Wynne was released from the home office, an unheard of event, and became Don's secretary. Lucky for us, Wynne came to Canada and later married Don. Wynne met her first Canadian friend, Vivian Lee, when applying for a job. My first memory of Wynne, said Viv, was the day we met. It was her appearance. She was incredibly well-groomed, well-dressed, and had gorgeous teeth. We became co-workers in the office of an insurance adjuster's company. We kept our typewriters at full speed. In other words, we were very good at what we did. I was intrigued by her cultured English language and would I ask her to say repeatedly, banana, banana, <laughs> which she did and kept right on typing. When she set her mind to something, you knew it was going to happen. Wynne invited me to go to England with her family. She insisted that we travel on the Queen Mary. No other ship would do, so on the Queen Mary we sailed. In 63 years, we may have had differences of opinion, but never a harsh word, and oh yes, lots of laughs. Working with Clay first brought Ann Roberts and Wynne together 45 years ago. The bond of friendship has seen these two women through some sad, but many happier times. Ann shared one story involving the beginning of the Waterloo Potters Workshop. The teachers were discussing where and how to get the best potting clay. Anne suggested they visit the local construction sites, gather up clay, then mix various combinations to formulate their very own Waterloo Potter's Workshop recipe. Then they could sell it. Wynne looked horrified. You mean we're gonna to have to mix all this clay with our hands? <laughs> she was somewhat mollified that with the help of their students, they would use a stick to mix it. Wynne's genuine interest in people cemented many friendships. One friend, Ann Courier, and another, John Croker, have worked for both Keith and Wynne for over 25 and 40 years, respectively. She spoke of them with pride and affection. Her John was a wizard at fixing anything. And that Ann, she knows something about everything. To quote John Croker, we shared many pleasant conversations. What started out as just a job those many years ago turned into a friendship that I will miss very much. She was a great lady. Lori Bryan, Wynne's accountant and friend, states simply, Wynne was my friend. She inspired me to be a better person. Her get on with it mantra helped steer me through some of my greatest challenges. While our lives were different, we were kindred in spirit and principles. I will miss her and love her forever. 
Real friendships survive time and distance, not only for experiences recalled, but the desire to share continued contact with those that have shared both joy and pain and past misfortunes and misfortunes. These are the words of Bruce Copeland, who along with his wife Frances ran a hotel on the Cayman Islands owned by Wynne and Keith. Retirement, after all, for Wynne and Keith would never be sitting around on the beach, would it? Her joy of theatrical arts is commemorated forever as a founding patron of the Inn at the Theatre at Cayman. Francis remembers Wynne's persuasive powers. Bruce, down, uh, Bruce grounded the, the yacht on a sandbar and refused to uh, use the engine to get us off of it. Wynne understood that you need to do things the right way. But she convinced, she totally convinced Bruce that expediency leads to more time for fun. Wynne's sense of the ridiculous, her profound joie de vie, was apparent every day of her life. Doug reminded me of one such example. It took her a bit, but Wynne started swinging the mallet with the best of them. We were on the coast of Maine and stopped at a lobster shack. You couldn't get any better than this. You picked your own lobster, they steamed it, and served it to you on a picnic table with paper towels and a mallet. Wynne was a little skeptical at the picnic table, but she was ready to eat. She, she looked for the nutcracker and small fork. After a minute, she commented that the restaurant was a little slow on bringing napkins and eating utensils. Doug said, I demonstrated how to use the mallet and suggested that the best we were going to get were paper towels, which we should probably or definitely use for bibs. That big smile appeared on her face. She picked up the mallet, started banging away at those lobsters, <laughs> and giggled with each stroke. Every time we were in Maine, we were asked to go back to that lobster shack. <laughs> Yvonne Stanton and Wynne's friendship evolved from their contact as occasional potters at the Wadley Potters Workshop <laughs> to the more frequent potting as the Duke Street Dollies, <laughs> who potted above the KW Racket Club, to the proprietors of SNS Pottery Supplies. They were the only women in Canada to run such a company. It involved moving heavy sacks of supplies. Yvonne fondly recalls it was not women's work. With Wynne on one end of the sack and me on the other, I said, don't you dare laugh. Because if we laughed, guess what? The contents would be dropped on the floor and fly all over the room. Wynne saw the funny side of everything, said Yvonne. We laughed by the 401 mile when we picked up supplies at Oakville. In, 50, in the 57 years I knew Wynne, she was always up for everything, anything. She was a gem. Kevin Wong and Janet Lynn cherished their friendship with Keith and Wynne. Every visit that I remember to Janet Lynn's started off with Kevin's very warm welcome of Wynne. She was at home at Janet Lynn's. Kevin said, when I wanted some fun, I spent time with Wynne. And when I needed advice, I spent time with Wynne. She would end her comments to me with, listen to mother. <laughs> About a year ago, Wynne invited Ray Stanton, Ray and Yvonne Stanton, and Doug and me to Janet Lynn's for dinner. Yvonne recalls it is one of the last, last together. She remembers that during dinner, Ray complained to Doug that he was having back trouble. Doug knew some exercises for the back. So the next thing we knew, Doug and Ray were on the floor of the restaurant. <laughs> Doug demonstrating, of course. Along came the waitress and said, oh, my boyfriend has a bad back. I should learn this. <laughs> she too got on the floor. <laughs> then Aggie thought the waitress needed some clarification, so she got on the floor. That left Wynne and me watching. She loved it. In the end, Kevin came out and took photographs. If Wynne called you friend, you were blessed. Her loyalty, love, and support were the pillars of her friendship, all given without fuss. Wynne seemed to intuit what you needed and with precision would help define and resolve the issues or just be on the other end of the phone listening and encouraging. She was also adept at giving a well-placed kick in the pants, whether you bent over for it or not. Over the years, Wynne and I have had many adventures. We've shared our dreams and our disappointments. 
weathered personal sorrows together, applauded each other's successes, and rejoiced in the many accomplishments of our families. I will miss you, dear friend. I know we're in church, but I'm raise your imaginary champagne glass and say, to win, we love you. Hello, I'm Rosemary Smith, the CEO of the Kitchener and Waterloo Community Foundation. And Aggie, thanks so much for getting the microphone at just the right height. I think the messages you've heard today about a lover of art, an individual with care and concern for community, are really the messages I want to take forward and talk with you about in terms of our community. Wynne was without a doubt a lover of art, but she also had the wherewithal to build and to nurture something very special in this community. She provided giving, giving of herself and giving of all sorts of resources to our community for well over 40 years. And it was always more than money. It was support, it was encouragement, it was her determination, it was her being a mentor, a leader, a visionary. She provided those gifts to the KW Symphony, to the Stratford Festival, to the Grand River Baroque Festival, to the Kitchener-Waterloo Art Gallery, to Brush With Art, and those are but a few of the legacies that Wynne has left. I had a conversation early on after Wynne's passing with Genevieve Toomey of the KW Symphony. And Genevieve shared with me that she really found that Wynne was amazing at getting you to talk about yourself. She would inevitably, and I think uh, Bill, you shared this, she would pull a check out very early in the conversation. So Genevieve didn't have to worry about where the fun conversation was going to come from. And the minute the check had been slid across the table, it was, tell me about you, tell me about your son, tell me about Edwin, how are things, bring me up to speed. This was a message I heard from many. And it was indicative, I think, this caring about people that was at the heart of her giving to places like the YWCA and becoming a member of the Mary Kaufman Circle. Wynne grew up in London, exposed to a whole array of culture. She knew and experienced what was possible. And as an aside, when I took my very first trip to London, she spent hours telling me all these wonderful places I had to visit and things I had to see, and I had a list as long as both arms. And I said, Wynne, I'm only there for eight days. We have to kind of shorten the list. She said, but you can't. You have to see it all. As you heard, after the Second World War, Wynne came to Canada and chose this community as her home. I'd like to read to you an excerpt from a Globe and Mail article that uh, was published shortly after Wynne's passing. While her husband worked as a recreational director for the YMCA, Winifred continued her secretarial work for insurance companies in town. After work, she'd fire up the kiln, throw pottery, and create teapots, creamers, and sugar bowls. She never took herself seriously as an artist, but she insisted that the work be taken seriously as an art form. And that was the first of many gifts that Wynne gave this community. I was chatting with Aggie uh, earlier and also again today, and I said, you know, Aggie, I've never seen a piece of Wynne's art. Does it really exist? And lo and behold, thanks to family, I understand there were pictures of some of that art that were shared with us today in the visual. Later in the 50s, as you've heard from Aggie again, that Wynne and a group of knitters, potters, and painters raised money for the Kitchener and Waterloo Art Gallery. Now I want you to picture this. They sold art in a bicycle shed beside KCI. They would, they would go and give up their time and their talent and their effort to get that art into good homes. But picture this. Here's Wynne, white gloves, we're in a bicycle shed. White gloves, beautifully coiffed, unbelievably well turned out, and what I have come to know as that amazing Winshawn smile. How could you resist? Of course, we have a Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery because she was amazing at helping you see the vision of art and what it could do. 
It's a vision I can still conjure up in my mind through the many experiences that Wynne and I shared. In 1966, with a handful of potters, she formed the Kitchener-Waterloo Potters Guild. She taught there, and she increased her involvement in the cultural scene. And as you've heard, uh, her first marriage to Don McLaren ended in 1972. Shortly thereafter, Wynne married Keith Shantz, and they made a formidable couple. They were very different from each other, I've been told, but they gave and they gave and they gave again to all sorts of causes within this community and beyond, to Western and many, many others. In 1992, I went to my very first Community Foundation meeting as a board member, and I was told at that meeting that Keith Shantz had passed away the night before. I have to tell you, we had leaders in this community, the likes of Jack Harper and John Panabaker and Walter Bean, who sat around that table absolutely gobsmacked at the, at the nature of the loss of Keith to this community. I hadn't yet met Wynne, but that was uh, changed very shortly there later when in 2001, I joined the Community Foundation as their Executive Director. A colleague of mine who had been on the board, Dave Uffelman, said to me, have you met Wynne Shantz yet? I said, no, as a matter of fact, I haven't. And he said, do yourself a favor. This woman is a treat to all who are in her life. Spend a little bit of time with Wynn, and you too will know the power of what she brings. Well, I did exactly that. I can talk about the meetings that we had at Janet Lynn's and that corner bench, where we talked about all manner of things important to this community. We talked about the clan glass, yes. We talked about the organization she cared about, undoubtedly. But we also talked about each other, we talked about what we cared about, and we talked about community. In 2002, shortly after I came to the Foundation, Wynne was honoured with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Kitchener and Waterloo Arts Awards. Well deserved, well earned, and stands in tribute to the kind of work that Wynne has done on behalf of our community. Aggie and I have giggled that 2002 was a very busy year because Aggie, who has described herself as a friend, I would say was much more than that to win, was a partner, was almost a daughter, and was truly a colleague in every way. The two of them were presented with the prestigious John Mather Award for a Lifetime Achievement. The Mather Award recipients are truly outstanding in their fields and have displayed exceptional commitment to the further development of craft in Ontario and indeed throughout Canada. Well, that was just the beginning of my getting to know Wynne. Around in about 2003, Wynne wandered into my office and said to me, what do you know about art stabilization? I confessed I knew nothing. Well, we got to do something about it. We have to do something for arts in this community. So help me. I said, well, leave it with me, Wynne. Let me figure this out. So I called my colleagues at the Bay Area Stabilization Fund in Hamilton, and the next thing I knew, Wynne and I went off on our very first adventure together. We drove to uh, Hamilton, and I watched what I call the curiosity, the passion, and the interest of that woman as she spent time understanding and learning about art stabilization. And this work was really the forerunner to the Prosperity Council's work, which has taken us into the creative sector. Wynne understood innately the importance of arts in building a community where it would have the economic wherewithal as well as the opportunity to share art for the pure joy of art. She was a doer, she wasn't a talker. If I heard her say, let's get on with it once, I heard it many times over the time I knew Wynne. Her patronage was generous, but so was her treatment of people. It didn't matter if you were a cleaning lady, it didn't matter if you were on the reception desk. It just simply mattered you were someone to be cared for. David Johnson, the former president and now our Governor General, wrote to Wynne, and I'd like to uh, quote to you from a, the letter he shared. As I step down to take on my new role as Governor General of Canada, I am filled with confidence for Waterloo's future because of you. You have been a key influence in the shaping of Waterloo's character and reputation. I talked with Ken Murray, who was a, a fellow I shared time with on the board of the Kitchener-Waterloo Art Gallery, and a dear friend of Wynne's and Keith's. And Ken said to me that 
You know, Wynne demonstrated by her involvements in her chosen community that by combining her skills, her will, and her love of artistic works, she, along with other team members who had similar interests, would make this community a better place for all of us and for all who would follow. Friend, mentor, coach, she didn't suffer fools. She never suffered fools. But she always treated them with a grace, a wit, and a tact that was the envy of all who knew her. At my age, Dr. Seuss remains one of my favorite folks to uh, quote. And he said, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. And this community will smile forever because Wynne touched us all in her mission to build a community where we could have pride in our cultural institutions and in the people who choose to call this region home. And we are forever fortunate that Wynne Shantz chose to call Waterloo Region home. Thank you. Listening to the many uh, eulogies presented by the speakers today uh, in the various uh, constituencies of the community, uh, the arts community, uh, the students, uh, and, uh, and so on, and I'm, I'm here to represent to her family, McLaren's. Uh, she was an, a member of, of both these, these organizations, part of the community, of course, very strongly. We heard, of course, about the Clay and Glass Gallery. She didn't belabor us with it, but we knew it was very important work that she was very, uh, very concerned about. And um, I, I wanted today to try and, and draw together the community and the family, because, of course, she was a member of both. And uh, there must be some commonality here. And um, in the community, she was well known as a bus businesswoman, patron of the arts. But what did that sponsorship consist of? I think it had to do with the creative process, starting with a dream, setting some goals, working forward through a lot of planning, the hard work of implementation, and resulting in something of real value, something new, a gallery, a business, a music festival, or the successful debut of a young artist. She could help you see you through setting these goals and making these plans. And this is what she did for the community for so many years. Well, what about the family? You know, it was very much the same. Uh, in our family, actually, we had a tradition, a rite of passage for the young folks known as the talk with Aunt Wynne. <laughs> when you reached 18 or so and knew everything, <laughs> she would sit you down and ask you what you were planning to do with your life. What do you want to be when you grow up? And once again, this was all about dreams, ideas, goals, and plans. And the kids knew very well that this was not just some nosy relative trying to make conversation. She really wanted to know. And she had the reputation in the community as someone who could move things along and make things happen. So the kids were always sure this was not an occasion for being airy-fairy or tossing off a flip and inconsiderate answer. She was going to take your dreams and ideas seriously so you should too. And if you hadn't thought seriously about your future before the talk, you would now. Of course, what made this great as a parent is this serious questions were not coming from the same voice that was saying, clean up your room, do your homework, and so on for so many years. They were being asked by someone who really understood ideas, dreams, goals, worked on the plans, sat on the boards and committees where dreams are made real. So, along with the many dinner parties, Janet Lynn's was, uh, of course, a very important venue for that, birthdays, weddings, other family occasions, she lent us to her wisdom, her criticism, her advice, her encouragement, 
and her generosity, just as she did to the arts community and the community at large. Looking for an adjective to describe this lady, the one that occurred to me was canny. It's a wonderful old Scottish word that has two meanings, really, in Scotland. It means, as we understand it, astute, wary, knowing. But in Scotland, it also means steady, restrained, and gentle. She could see right through you, beyond pretense. If your dreams had too much of Don Quixote about them, she would let you know in a firm but gentle way. She taught us all to dream the possible dream. Now our kids knew instinctively that uh, with that one you were always on your very best behavior. And that went for the grown-ups as well. Uh, but that wasn't a strain or a burden because she was always fun to be with. And from what I've heard from that, uh, from, the, from the municipality, from the university, from the arts community today, in so many ways, she helped bring out the very best in all of us. Lastly, uh, if any of you were in doubt about her zest for life, be assured that it remains strong to the end. That last week, she attended the Canadian Opera Company's Tosca with us in Toronto. She and Aggie showed us around Harbinger for the latest works there. And she took us around Ann Roberts' show at the Clay and Glass Gallery. And over lunch at Corio's, she led us in planning for next year's opera season. No, this isn't deja vu. I'm Neil McLaren. <laughs> there are many who've contributed to the planning of this day of celebration and whom I wish to acknowledge at this time. I must start with thanks to the Clay and Gas Glass Gallery, personified by Bill and William, for their assertive assist insistence that our celebration should be here, and their unquestioning help in making it happen. Thanks as well to those two women, Laurie Bryan and my wife Sheila, who have kept me on task and offered help whenever and wherever they could. Thank you to the KW Symphony and their mu musicians, Lance Willette, Aline Chumman, Jody Davenport and John Helmers, who have provided musical comment to the day. They're playing as we gathered, and they're greeting us with music as we move to the gallery, provides words to our souls that English cannot encompass. And a special thanks goes out to the Roberts family, Anne, the son Owen, and daughter-in-law Krista, for their guidance as we began the planning process and their advice and counsel along the way. To the Bainan family, the Brown family, the McLaren families, and the Shant Smith family, a special thanks for their help in providing images for today's video presentation. To my sister, Sue Brown, thanks for the many hours of work spent in producing it. To Vivian Lee, for memories that none of us had, and for Vivian's gracious and loving support to all. To our caterers and servers in advance for what we will share in a short time. To our speakers today, Bill Poole, Rosemary Smith, Eggie Bainham, and my brother Donald, who tried to capture in far too few words what wind shots meant to us. Thanks. And finally, thanks to all of you for your presence here. Some final thoughts. Life doesn't always bring us what we would like. 
Some days it gets us down with responsibility, sorrow, worry, or politics, which is to say all three. When it does, look again at some favorite piece of art and let that open your eyes. Listen again to some beloved piece of music and let your ears hear the music of the world. Speak to family and friends and let your heart be full again. Or read a book, attend a play, lecture, or watch the news and let your mind quicken with the possibilities of today. The past informs us. The future inspires us. But today fulfills us. So let us be open to every day. Win once. Thank you, Neil, and um, my thanks to everyone as well for coming. Now, I would invite you to, uh, to uh, cross the street at the light, please, um, <laughs> to come to the gallery for uh, what is going to be a wonderful chance to chat with one another, to remember when so fondly, and, um, and to enjoy each other's company. Uh, I will just make two um, quasi-crass uh, announcements, if I may. One is that uh, um, I should be not, not the least bit crass. Um, one is that Anne Roberts, the catalog for Anne Roberts show is available today for sale at the at the gallery shop. It's forty five dollars, so it's uh, it's it's glorious and wonderful. And Christian and uh, Singer is here, took responsibility for that. Um, and then also a week from last night on the twenty fourth is our second Earth Fire and Light Gala. And I can say without any fear of being contradicted that Wynne would have wanted you to be there. So uh, the tickets are $100 and they are available also at the gallery shop. So look forward to seeing you there as quickly as we can get there. Thank you very, very much.